We were hoping that um, first um, maybe each of you could just um, give everybody here in the room and also um, watching a, a little description for a couple of minutes about some of your activities and, and what hap what's happening in your, your club and in your community. So maybe we could just go right down the row. Okay. Uh, my name is Doug Rodenbeck and I was the Indiana State LEO chairman um, and also uh, I'm currently uh, a member of the I uh, International LEO Advisory Panel. Uh, our big project in the LEOs was the uh, burn suites, the family suites which we built at the St. Joe Regional Medical Center. The LEOs found out that there was a great need for uh, a place of refuge for people who had family members in critical condition in the burn unit. Uh, the galvanizing story for that was there was a, a teenage boy who was there for 72 days and uh, he uh, was in a medically induced coma for a lot of that time and the family of course didn't want to leave his bedside. Uh, generally the family members don't want to when they're they're that bad off. They don't want to go blocks away at a hotel in case something might change. So um, the problem that one of the problems that occurred with that was that his younger brother ended up sleeping on the floor next to his brother's bed. And that kind of made people start to think, gee, maybe we ought to have a place of refuge for these people, a place where they could be right near them. So we talked about converting an area in the hospital that would have um, some sleeping rooms, a living area, kitchen area, laundry facility, and a business area. And uh, I asked the Leos if they wanted to lead the fundraising drive on that. And they immediately took out, went all over the state of Indiana making presentations, and we ended up in a year and a half uh, raising $170,000 <clears throat> $170, for that project, and it has been successfully uh, uh, operating for the last year and a half. And to give you an idea of how that impacts people, uh, we had one letter of thank you from uh, a, a lady who, uh, whose husband was in the burn unit, and the thank you simply said, I don't have an end address anymore. Our house blew up. Thank you for letting me stay there. Wow. <laughs> Mr. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm carrying a sore throat today. Uh, but I really don't want to pass up this opportunity because it's uh, kind of rarefied air when I think of champions sitting up here and I look out at the people I know in this audience. It is it's truly a two-way mirror. And uh, this is really, really an opportunity, uh, uh, I think, for us to uh, celebrate together the enormous and incredible work of Lions on the national and the international scale. So thank you very much. I'm honored and I'm humbled and uh, really delighted to be part of this group. Um, multiple District 13K is a very typical, a very typical multiple district. We're involved in most of those things that really relate to our, our everyday living in, in communities in Ohio. Very involved in youth work, not only Lions Quest, Project Good, uh, we have a youth camp, uh, we're involved in disaster relief, and we're very diligent about that. I happen to be, just coincidentally, involved in uh, Thornville Lions Club, which is the best club uh, in the district, which is the best district in the state, which happens to be the best district in the country. So it's, it's very coincidental indeed. Uh, in, in, in terms of representing youth, I, I, again, it just it blows my mind and always has. I wanted to be a teacher since I was in the fifth grade. Uh, and I even wanted to be more involved in youth work since I taught emotionally delinquent youth at the seventh grade level. Um, I was in a classroom that had a red telephone next to my desk because these kids were so distressed, so distraught, so unleveled in terms of their living uh, style at age 13 and 14 that it was incomprehensible. So we knew something had to be done in terms of dealing with kids like this at every level. So my involvement in Lion's Quest uh, started in 1982. 
uh, and as a recovering teacher, uh, I just couldn't be prouder. Uh, today, uh, I'm proud to say we have reached since 1982 because of your work. I've been a very, very small cog in this very, very big wheel, trust me. Uh, but we have reached, uh, grasped this, in excess of 12 million students and still are with the skills and the tools and the attitude to make positive, healthy decisions. So when you read the paper and you hear about the 25%, don't forget the 75% that you're reaching every day doing the hard work through programs like Lion's Quest in the school system. 74 countries, 35 languages, with half a million teachers in every country, um, almost every country doing our work. So thank you again. Okay, um, I'm Debbie. I guess you figured that out right now. Huh? <laughs> uh, probably the, the scariest thing I've ever experienced was being the seated district governor and a disaster right at the end of my year, a 14 mile long EF5 tornado coming through uh, basically my backyard. Uh, the tremendous uh, stress that that caused uh, wondering what what to do what are we going to do <clears throat> immediately I had over 200 phone calls from you all from the Lions I shouldn't have been surprised uh, Lions were rushing in with phone calls money uh, requests to, to help in any way they sought possible and that's just what Lions do across the world and um, we had immediate access within 24 hours, less than 24 hours we knew. We had $10,000 coming from LCIF, so we were able to immediately mobilize and create energy packs with energy drinks. Uh, we had energy bars, trail mix, things with substance. We knew we were in excessive heat. Uh, the people were going through trying to find something that belonged to them that was precious that maybe they did not lose in the tornado. The lions, we went out into the area. We brought uh, those much needed supplies along with leather gloves, sunscreen, anything we could think of that we thought um, would be handy or helpful to the people in the area. Having the money available like that uh, to get to our neighbors was extremely important. There were seven of our own lions in Joplin that lost their homes. And so uh, I do have to brag on those lions. Some of those lions that lost their homes were there at the Lions Club building grilling hamburgers with us and taking uh, food out to, to those devastated. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is our partnership with the First Response Team of America. Through that partnership, the Lions, all of us, were able to turn about $70,000 into a million dollars worth of cleanup for free for the people of Joplin, Missouri. They knew the Lions were there. We're still there today. A project we're working on right now is um, Irving Elementary is going to be built at the place of the hospital site. And it's, it's our goal as Lions it's my goal. I think we're going to do this. <laughs> well, I see lions. They, they are given a challenge, and they meet not only meet it, they exceed it. We were supposed to plant a million trees. We planted 15 million trees. Um, lions are going to plant trees on Irving Elementary, every tree there. It's going to be about 25,000 to do that. We've already got 10,000. So um, a, almost a year and a half later, lions, we're still there. We're still working hard, and I couldn't be more proud to be here today representing all of you. Hello, or aloha. Aloha. <laughs> I'm Nadine Nishioka. I'm from the Honolulu Manoa Waioli Lions Club. And I just honestly have to say that I alone am not the champion of the environment. If it were not for the Lions of Hawaii, there would be no champion of the environment because someone asked me the other day, do you have environmental problems in Hawaii? Well, if you don't notice it, that means the Lions of Hawaii are doing a fantastic job. <laughs> so, you know, so I just have to give kudos to the Lions of Hawaii, all of us. So, but um, at this time, actually, I would like to share with you that the Lions of Hawaii do other things because I will definitely talk about the environment. But this week in Hawaii right now, we have something going on called SOS Week. 
and it's called Seven Days of Service. And I'm actually the chair of that week, this week, and it started Sunday, so I've been on the phone back and forth saying, they're like, let it go, you're fine, you're, we're doing fine. So, and I truly believe they're carrying on. This past Sunday, we had a Lions Foundation walk, over 300 people on every island we had a walk. And what's special, and I wanna share this with all of you, what's special about that is that the money raised goes for vision and hearing screenings for the state of Hawaii. The state no longer does vision and hearing screenings for school children because they have no funding. So children have, um, excuse me, Lions have stepped up to the plate, so to speak, and we perform as many vision and hearing screenings as we can throughout the state. And we have on-site lions who are optometrists and audiologists who are there to give professional opinions. And I wanna share a personal story with you which gives you a lot of insight to the great job all of us do as lions. I went to a hearing screening and there's this one young girl, she was standing in a corner by herself. And I asked the teachers, why is she there by herself? They said, well, she's a special ed student, so we, she doesn't really participate in a lot of these other things. Um, she gets excited. So I said, well, you know, she should participate as a, a member of the student body. So they would talk to her and they'd ignore her. Then I heard her humming a Japanese song. So I went up to her and I spoke to her in Japanese. And she looked at me and, tr and I could tell she was watching my lips. And so she would turn away. But then I would touch her and speak to her in Japanese again and she would look at my lips. So I brought her over to the hearing uh, testing area and I put earphones on her. And you know what happened? She's hearing impaired. She's not special ed. So to this day, she is using hearing aids and she's among her peers at the elementary school and Lions did that. So I'm very proud of that. So, so I just wanted to... So I just wanted to share that with you because all over the world we're doing a lot of good and I would definitely talk about how lions are saving the environment in Hawaii. Thank you. Hello, I'm Laura Rigg. I'm really nervous. <laughs> <coughs> I'm an early childhood special education teacher from Portsmouth, <coughs> Virginia. Can you hear me better? Okay. Um, our club is Portsmouth Children's First Lions Club, and it's a little different from other clubs because all of us, all of our members um, are intimately involved with um, working with children with special needs. So we have speech pathologists, psychologists, um, my principal at Olive Branch Preschool is a member, uh, a social worker, um, teachers and assistant teachers. We all work together um, to meet the needs of the children at our four preschool centers. Um, and because we have lines at each school, it helps us to be aware of what the needs are so we can be responsive to those needs. So we have provided um, glasses, hearing aids, excuse me, <clears throat> adaptive equipment uh, for playgrounds, and we even sponsored uh, an Eagle Scout who built an adaptive playground for two and three year olds with special needs. Um, but our newest project is the one that we're most excited about. And that one is concerning literacy and language development. And um, what we want to do is we've partnered with a local shelter in Portsmouth. And we're working with another agency that works with early childhood um, with early childhood families in their home. And we're providing books for them and also language extension activities. So we're teaching the parents how to be teachers and raising their confidence in, in um, teaching their children to not only enjoy books, but to foster language development as a whole. So that when they come to preschool, they're prepared and ready. Fantastic. Um, well, I know everybody in this room is not surprised by these stories because we know that um, while these are particularly special uh, champions of change, uh, we all know that this goes on around the world every day um, with every club, uh, with all the Lions Club members, and I hope folks watching um, will learn a lot about what this amazing organization does. So um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to talk about it. I, w I was hoping to ask uh, each panelist a little bit more about um, some of the things they mentioned, and then if we have time, maybe talk a little bit more generally about things like service and volunteerism. Um, 
Doug, when, when you were describing your programs and everything, you, you mentioned something called LEO clubs. And I know the, the many people here know what they are, but I was hoping you could describe a little bit more uh, what is LEO club as opposed to Lions Club and how does it fit in to the whole service ethic of the organization? Certainly. Uh, LEOs are a project of Lions Clubs International. LEOs uh, range in age from, uh, the, well, the Alpha LEOs are from 12 to 18, and then the uh, Omega LEOs are from 18 to 30. And it's, it's an outreach program to encourage and promote and educate young people around the world in community service. And uh, we do that by offering them opportunities. Uh, the first opportunity would be the name recognition and credibility of Lions Clubs International allows them to accomplish whatever they would like for the good of their community. I tell them this is your magic wand. It's, it's your ability to change your community for the better as you would like to do it. Also, the resources of Lions can, can become a, uh, a big uh, project. We had one club, uh, the Portage uh, Middle School Club, which is sponsored by my club, Anthony Wayne Lions. They were going to hold a chicken barbecue. And uh, unfortunately, it rained on that day. And the advisor called up, said the, the faculty advisor, and said, what am I going to do? And I said, no problem. I happen to know that your sponsoring club has a tent. And they made one call. The club came out and put up a tent. And it enabled them to raise $3,500 for their school, which was the largest uh, fundraiser that that junior high school had ever had, according Fantastic. to the principal. Fantastic. Um, Mike, you also uh, mentioned a term that maybe not everyone who's watching would be familiar with, because you mentioned um, Lion's Quest. And so could you, could you describe that a little bit and, um, and how that fits into the overall initiatives that you guys are doing in your, um, sure. was it MD13K? MD13, right. Um, Lion's Quest, um, not dissimilar to Doug's project, it is a project of Lion's Clubs International. Uh, started in 1984. It was a, it was a project uh, of the Board of Trustees at that time uh, of Lions, uh, a very, very um, firm decision to become intricately involved in the drug prevention issue in this country particularly and worldwide eventually. Uh, and it, uh, it really approached the issue of drug prevention from a holistic perspective which you would certainly uh, understand, Eric, in your work. But uh, the determination was made, and, and the reason it's lasted 30 years, that drug prevention in and of itself is not the issue. It's not drugs per se, it's not violence, it's not bullying. It's, it's a people problem. And if programs were going to be integrated into the school, they needed to be people savvy. And so we worked with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Lions Clubs International Foundation, uh, Reader's Digest Association, and developed a program that was really built on the, the shoulders of research at that time. It's a K-12 based, K-12 curriculum that relies heavily on integrating the community, the parents, and the school because research is so firm about that. And, uh, and, and that program was so desperately needed, it became national with within six months, international within 12 months, and, and basically because the needs of kids are universal. You don't separate a child's head from a child's heart, and unless you really approach the issues of, of uh, children holistically, you're really not going to have much luck. Bullying approached at the seventh grade level is going to be less than effective. Drug prevention, et cetera. So uh, Lion's Quest is, has really become a very, very successful a product of, of what we know works and best practice. And it's, uh, it's attracted the, uh, uh, the acclaim and the attention of most federal and most international organizations at this point. So, uh, yes. Thank you very much. Um, Debbie, um, you know, well, I was hoping we could learn from you because, um, you know, you described the incredible outpouring of energy and effort to help the people um, after the tornado. Um, once the cameras leave and the immediate crisis is gone, then sometimes things um, sort of start to fade away a little bit. Could you, could you give all of us some lessons learned and tips about how you maintain the, the effort in things, because we, we know that, um, you know, 
it may be a year and a half ago, but there's still lots of things, as you described one example, lots of things um, that need to be done. What are the ways to really keep the momentum going? Well, I think I'm glad you asked that question because um, we're, we're <coughs> already, all of us Lions, we, we're already there. We're already in position. We're, this is, you know, when something like this happens in our communities, we're already home. And this is our family. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to keep the momentum because uh, we truly care about the people that are affected. Uh, lions generally are very compassionate people. And uh, we don't walk away uh, mm -hmm. because we're already home. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to continue. Fantastic. So um, Nadine, you, you, you alluded to all your work um, <laughs> involving the environment. So um, could, can you now yes. sort of describe what you all have been doing and why Absolutely. it's important? Right. Um, well, as you all know, um, I'm sure all of you have been to Hawaii or would like to come to Hawaii. <laughs> 2015, 2015. So um, in the environment, as you all know, that Hawaii is a beautiful place and the viability of our state depends on the environment, our beaches, our mountains, our valleys, everything. And what we like to do as a state, the Lions, is help to keep it beautiful. And one of the projects that we work on is called uh, No Dumping in Drains. And that is because if you dump in your drains, it leads to the ocean. It goes into the streams, the rivers, the canals, directly into our ocean. If our ocean is not beautiful, the tourists and visitors and even locals will not go. And there goes the viability of our state. So lions come together, and we, the city does not have the resources to do, to do it all. There's literally thousands of drains. So lions get together, and we do a, a, a block or two of drains on any given day. And it's a great time for fellowship. We have people coming out of their homes, other organizations coming out, and we actually get people who want to donate money to help because they tell us, you know, we were wondering who was going to step up and help us do this. Because we do not only stencil drains, on the same day, we do painting over of graffiti. So we cover a lot of things because not only natural environment, but environmentally friendly to your eyes. So if there's graffiti, we paint it over and we clean stream beds. We clean whatever it takes to make the environment beautiful, both with your eyes and in our ocean, so that you can visit us and always remember a beautiful Hawaii because the lions of Hawaii are helping to save the environment. Thank you very much. So um, Laura, you don't have to be nervous because you did a great <laughs> job um, in your introduction. And um, may, maybe you could describe in a little greater detail, you, you talked about adaptive equipment and things like that. What, what, can you describe a little bit more what, what that is and, and why it's needed? Well, um, playgrounds need to fit the children that are meant to play on them. And two and three year olds are much smaller than you know a 10 year old or a four year old. But they also have different sensory needs. Um, for example, Children with autism sometimes benefit from bouncing or jumping. So um, we purchased a, a trampoline with padding around the side so it's safe for them in there. Um, or things that swing back and forth are really calming and, um, and good for them. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so um, as luck would have it this morning, I was at uh, another event in Washington where they brought together youth from all over the world, and um, they, they're there to talk about their projects um, in service and things that they're trying to do to better the community. And um, you, you see the energy and the entrepreneurialism of those folks. Um, you all have um, years and years of experience, and I, I was hoping that um, um, I could toss one question to, and maybe you all could speak to it. It's, it's two parts. One is, um, how, how do you encourage people to service? I mean, they, they could, they have a lot of choices in their lives and people are really, really busy, but um, what are some of the ways that you encourage people to service and, and what do people most frequently say their, the rewards are from that? So that's one. And then, um, and then the second is, as they get involved then in, in service, you know, what are some of the lessons learned about what works and what doesn't, because some people get discouraged, frankly, and they may not necessarily see results right then and there. And what are some of the lessons learned to keep 
keep the momentum going and, and, and encouraging and achieving change the way all of you have with your clubs and, and everybody else here in the audience. So maybe if we uh, just uh, go down the row and starting with Doug and you could speak to, to those two things. Yes, I, uh, that's, that's a good question for me because ironically, I, I told you I got into, I'm the uh, state Leo chairman from Indiana, or was up until this last month. And uh, I got into that uh, because I was encouraged by another champion of change who will be on the next panel, Greg Jeffrey. And uh, he uh, arranged to send me to a conference, which was, again, ironically, at the very place where we had our reception the other night, where this conference was held. And the, the main thing I learned at that conference, it was a conference on how to run successful organizations. And it was co-sponsored by the Lions. And the main thing that they, they said in that was that successful programs are run by people who are enthusiastic about their, their program and show it. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've, got to, you've got to live it, breathe it, you've got to accept it in your heart. And I, I found that that works in the LEO program and I've used that, that model and uh, it's been very successful for us as far as keeping people <coughs> uh, enthused, success breeds success. Uh, I, have, uh, I have one LEO club that is made up entirely of blind students. And uh, they, uh, in addition to going all around the state, they have their own van, and they'll go anywhere in the state and make presentations for you. And in addition to that, they've raised $12,000 in one year for cancer research. Wow. And Fantastic. every one of those students is blind. Fantastic. Um, I've got another, another uh, the Sharing Hearts Leo Club. Um, they, their annual Christmas project alone is between eight and ten, eight and twelve thousand dollars every year just on that one project. Fantastic. Success breeds success. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, your thoughts? There's <clears throat> certainly a lot of study on that today, and, and the field of service learning, as it's called, is pretty robust. And there, there are a set of disciplines that that students can be taught and should be taught. I think two quick answers, though, to your question. One is modeling. I think Doug is sort of referring to that in some ways, that unless they see their peers, their parents, their brothers, and their sisters uh, honoring the ethic of service, they're less likely to be involved, and certainly the earlier, the better. But in terms of Lion's Quest, there's a very, very specific response to that, and that is we begin early to make young people comfortable with themselves, learn the art and the skills of empathy, uh, social responsibility, personal responsibility, communication, and then to see a picture bigger than themselves. There's a lot of exciting research that shows that young people in the middle high school level who get involved in something bigger than themselves, nursing or teaching or doing some shadowing of professions, are much more likely to be involved. They get better grades. Oftentimes, they go into that profession. Oftentimes, service becomes part of their life. And of course, that's what we're hoping for in Lions, that they see that vision early and, and, and often. So it can be taught. It, it doesn't, it's not magical. And, and experience in doing it again and again, I think, is part of that for me. We, we see that. And it's, uh, today, there's a workshop, two workshops, going on in New York City. It's Lions Quest, the largest school district in our country, and uh, they're committed to that. They, all the problems they have, they see the young people committing to service as one of the way out of it. So it's Fantastic. exciting stuff. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Any your thoughts? Um, probably telling our stories, the individual people and lives that we mm -hmm. touch, we all have stories. And um, just like the, the older gentleman that walked to the Lions Club building and he and his wife were living in someone's garage and they'd been eating out of a can. Uh, they had no car their, car, their home was completely gone, but he walked down to the Lions Club building to get a hamburger and he was too exhausted from the heat and um, driving him, I've never given anybody a ride in my life, but I did that day. <laughs> I gave him a ride um, down to the home where he and his wife were staying and um, him breaking down in my seat and weeping, sobbing, uh, asking me to tell the lions that that hamburger meant everything to him. The individual stories, the fellow that came into my 
office two weeks ago that was getting ready to have a baby and he was looking for a lion. Um, he was blind in one eye and uh, very, very low vision in the other and we were able to get him a pair of eyeglasses quickly so last Tuesday when his baby was born he was able to see his baby. We tell the stories, the, the individual stories, mm -hmm. that's what attracts people and then we engage them and involve them in our projects and um, they want to be a part of what we've got already. Fantastic, fantastic. Nadine, your thoughts? Well, I think, first of all, when you want, um, you know, you want people to serve, you have to remember that they're all volunteers. And you have to respect them as volunteers, even as lions. So I really do think that service begins at home in your own club. If you can't get members of your own club to serve, it would be really difficult to get members outside in the community to follow your lead. Because as has been mentioned, you should lead by example. So in our clubs back in Hawaii, what we do is we find things that members are passionate about. And they in turn will get other people passionate in the community to serve. And we do things in the parks. We, we pour concrete and we we lay sod where it's necessary, we build gardens because there's a dirt pathway between two gyms and it was awful to look at. It wasn't environmentally friendly. So we have members in our club who raise flowers. And so we said, would you like to lead making a garden? And these were members who maybe weren't as active, but all of a sudden became active, brought in new members because now they found a passion. So I think when you talk about service, you need to talk about things that you yourself can relate to, something that you are passionate about and something that you believe in. And when I say believe in, I not only believe that we only think about lions and only lions. I think that we should respect other organizations and work alongside other organizations. Um, in Hawaii, we work alongside the Hawaii Red Cross with their hats off and during, it's part of our um, seven days of service by helping the food bank, et cetera, and it ends this week Saturday with a <coughs> statewide food drive. Last year, we raised over $6,000 and almost 10,000 pounds of food statewide, and we're working on that again come this Saturday statewide. And so I think if you can get your own members to serve with pride, the community, community can rally around you and also serve with pride. Thank you, Nadine. And Laura. Well, as I mentioned, our club members are all educators, so mm -hmm. we, we have a vested interest in the success of students. Mm -hmm. But there's a critical period between birth and, and three years old for brain development. And mm -hmm. if we get them at three, we're, we're getting to the end of that window of opportunity. So our members wanted to go the next step and say, okay, well, how can, we re how can we reach the children before they ever come to school? Because it really does need to start before they're even born. And that's what we want to teach young mothers, is mm -hmm. um, to talk with their children, talk with them when they're in the grocery store and they're getting apples, and say, well, what kind of apples should we get? Red, yellow, green, and how many? And then talk to your infant child, who's not going to respond and tell you what color but just to build that language base and to help the children. Um, maybe they wouldn't qualify for special education services in the first place um, if they have that background. Because really it's 97% of the children who qualify for early childhood special ed services are because they have a language delay. And a language delay affects all other areas of development. Fantastic. So. Thank you. So um, I want to make sure that we leave time for the next panel. But um, uh, you know, picking up on something that Mike said, um, um, he was talking about modeling. And I think, um, and, and also people were talking about telling stories. And you all kindly shared the stories of your work and that of your districts and your clubs. And I think that's part of um, the reason why um, President Obama and Mrs. Obama are so enthusiastic about trying to do events like these because really um, you are modeling uh, not only for Lions Club, but you're really modeling for um, everybody in the United States about how we as citizens can help each other. And um, th these are just amazing um, stories and service and, and reaching out to others. So, I, I would just like to salute all of you and your clubs and your members um, for everything that you're doing, that you're modeling, and for sharing your stories with everybody in the room and those watching through the 
the internet, uh, all the wonderful things that you're doing. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.